Please take your seats. We're about to begin. Good morning. I'm Andres Alonso. You have our bias in uh, the program. I'm a professor of practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, and we have this extraordinary panel of uh, researchers, uh, policy makers, uh, actors in the uh, task of improving uh, education in the public schools in Massachusetts. And uh, of course, we're here to uh, uh, debate, discuss, uh, look into, uh, research into the effectiveness of public schools and uh, uh, explore how that uh, research affects uh, question two uh, in our ballot in November. You should know that I, I followed a car on the way here that had a sticker in the back say, that said, say no to question two. Uh, so it's, it's something that's very much in the uh, mind of uh, many, many people. And of course, part of what we want is for uh, questions of policy to be based on uh, all the evidence that is there. Uh, our, uh, our format is going to be uh, first, uh, Three of our panelists uh, in the following order, uh, Josh Angris, Tom Kane, and Mackie Raymond, are going to have, uh, hopefully, uh, at most, uh, we will be tight, uh, 10 minutes to present uh, research findings. Then we will have uh, uh, two respondents uh, from the field of policy and practice, Alan Jelen and then Paul Schlickman. Uh, and then we will have a, they will have five minutes. We will then have a 20 minute period where uh, I will ask them to reconcile the differences and follow up on their statements. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then hopefully we, we intend, uh, you will have a roughly 20 minute period where you can ask uh, follow up questions. And uh, let me introduce very briefly who our panelists are. Uh, first, we will hear from Joshua Angrist, who is full professor of economics at MIT, uh, a research associate in the NBER's program on children education and labor studies. He's been teaching at MIT for roughly 20 years. He's the director of MIT School Effectiveness and Equality Initiative. Uh, we use his economic, econometrics methods to study the links between education and the labor markets and effects on school reform. And he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has published dozens of academic articles related to the economics of uh, education. Who will be followed by my colleague, Tom Kane, who's an economist uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, faculty director of the Center for Education Policy Research. He directed the measures of effective teaching project for the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and uh, he's, uh, uh, he's Quoted often in many, many places. Uh, he's a great colleague uh, at the uh, School of Education. Uh, Maki Raymond is the director of the Center for Research and Education Outcomes since Credo, since its inception. Uh, she has steered the group to national promises, prominence as a rigorous and independent source for policy and program analysis. She leads uh, that organization and in investigating the effectiveness of public school charter schools and prior to joining the faculty at Stanford in 2000 she held faculty positions in the political science and economics department at the University of Rochester. Alan Jelen is a retired journalist who covered education for the Patriot Ledger newspaper and wrote for the Nova series, the National Education Association's NEA Today magazine and Rethinking Schools magazine. He also directed a middle school science education project at WGBH and produced a televised science and math teachers professional development series at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics for the Animal Foundation. He currently serves on the Citizens for Public Education's board and uh, he received a PhD in sociology from Harvard in 1979. Paul Schlichman served as president of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees in 2004. Uh, as president, he was an activist who focused on strengthening the voice of school committee members across the Commonwealth. He's in his 15th year, you should get a hand for that, uh, 
uh, at the school committee of the town of Arlington, and uh, he served four years as a member of the Minutemen Regional Vocational Technical School Committee before his election to the Arlington School Committee in 2001. So uh, an extraordinary panel, uh, huge diversity of perspectives and uh, experience, and we will begin with uh, uh, Joshua Andres, who will have Thank you, Andres. Thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, it looks like uh, we're headed for a fun and, and interesting morning. Uh, thanks very much to everybody for coming out on this uh, a beautiful fall day and spending some time with us to discuss uh, this important question. Uh, what I'll do, I'll use my brief time uh, to kind of set the stage with some uh, results from research that we're doing here at the uh, MIT uh, School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative, where I'm a faculty member. Uh, this is part of an ongoing research agenda looking at uh, charter school effects uh, in Boston, in Massachusetts, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, around the country. Uh, one thing that's important is uh, we think that our research is um, uh, more than just, you know, studies show, you hear people say studies show something. Uh, we're, we're very lucky in Massachusetts because the state requires oversubscribed charter schools to admit their students by lottery, so they use an element of, of randomness uh, to admit their students, and we exploit that to, to study those schools and, and to provide very convincing evidence where we're really comparing apples to apples. Uh, let me start with a little bit of very quick background. Of course, this is familiar to most of you. Massachusetts charters are, are funded by sending districts. Uh, the teachers uh, there are typically outside the local school district collective bargaining agreements. The charters are authorized by the state. They're subject to review and revocation. In Massachusetts, that's a binding constraint. There's a fair number of charter schools that have been closed. Their charters have been lost. Uh, in Boston, uh, the charter sector is expanding. Uh, in other urban districts, the charter sector is expanding. Generally, statewide, charters are not a particularly large uh, 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 portion of overall enrollment. Our team, that, that means the uh, SEII team, the Mass MIT uh, School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative team, uh, used the Massachusetts admissions lotteries to study charter effects, and we've done that in three uh, Massachusetts settings, Boston, uh, Lynn, which hosted the first KIPP school, uh, in New England and, uh, and then in a study of uh, Massachusetts urban and non-urban districts. And out of this uh, wide range of evidence, a fairly consistent but also somewhat nuanced picture emerges. Urban charters, these are mostly uh, what we call no excuses charters. No excuses is kind of a pedagogical profile that uh, involves a long school day, a long school year, uh, and other uh, features that I'll describe uh, briefly later. Um, these urban no excuses charters uh, generate very impressive achievement gains and also post-secondary gains. That's a, that means a increasing achievement and increasing college enrollment for their students. These are mostly low-income minority students, including, as I'll show you very quickly, uh, special education students and English language learners. Statewide, the picture is more mixed. And, uh, uh, the non-urban districts uh, tend to have lower performing charters, and indeed some of those charters are not producing the same level of achievement as the surrounding public schools. Here's a very quick picture of how we analyze data. Uh, I'll have lots of numbers for you, and I'm going to blow through them uh, fairly quickly. We'll have time maybe to reflect on these as the discussion develops. This is an example of uh, how we study a school like uh, KIPP. It's a single school. It admits its students by lottery. These are data from KIPP in the uh, 2005 to 2008 admission cycles. We compare test scores of kids who were offered a seat at KIPP and who were not offered a seat at KIPP. We measure scores in standard deviations relative to the state mean, so that means a score of zero for an urban district is good because an urban district that scores at the level of, of the state mean is doing well. Typically, urban districts are well below the state mean. They're below the state mean by about a third of a standard deviation, and that's what you see here. So lottery losers at KIPP, people who were not offered a seat at KIPP, have achievement later that's about 0.36 standard deviations below the state mean. Lottery winners at KIPP, and again, this is a remarkable finding. Don't be fooled by the units here. They're scoring at the state mean. It's remarkable because it's a very low income, high poverty, 
mostly uh, non-white population that would not ordinarily do that well. So the difference here between these two is about 0.36. I can't do that very neatly with my finger. Um, and to make sense of that unit, keep in mind that the black-white achievement gap in Massachusetts is about 0.7, which means that two years at Kip Lynn closes the black-white achievement gap. That's a remarkable finding. Actually, the effects are even bigger. I need to adjust for the fact that not everybody offered a seat in KIPP actually goes there. Only about 78% of the kids who are offered a seat in KIPP actually go there. Some of the kids who are not offered a seat in the lottery end up in KIPP through other uh, uh, channels. And so what I really need to do is scale that 0.36 sigma by 0.74, and I find that a year in KIPP boosts, in this case, math achievement by about almost half a standard deviation. That's uh, the kind of gain that's rarely seen in education research, rarely seen in social science. Let me now briefly summarize some results from other settings. This, these are a set of results. Um, they've been um, reported in various places. This is from a, a, a report and a paper we published in 2009. This shows lottery winners versus losers. And these are effects at Boston Charter High Schools. This is before. Zero means no difference between charter and traditional. A positive number favors charters. A negative number favors traditionals. This is the pre-application period. These are test score differences in the pre-application periods. You can see they're pretty much close to zero. In one case, uh, there's even a negative number. And then these are all positive numbers in the post-treatment period. And if we got into the weeds here, I would show you that these are statistically significant gains. Also, I'm not adjusting for the fact that not everybody who was offered a seat actually goes. So really, to find the effect of actually going to a charter school, I would need to adjust these offer effects, as I did for KIPP uh, in the earlier slide. Here are results for Boston middle schools. This allows us to follow people through time. Uh, in the uh, high school setting, we only get one test score. We get that 10th grade test score, but in middle school, we get multiple test scores. Again, in the pre-lottery period, so I think this is a fifth grade score, we see that the numbers there are close to zero. Charter versus traditional is a zero. And then the math pulls away. The ELA, that's reading, pulls away. The math pulls away more dramatically, but the gains in reading are also significant. And you can see these gains accumulating over time. And again, to get the units right, to figure out the effect of actually going to a charter school as opposed to being offered a seat in a charter school, I should really double these numbers. So consistent gains at Boston Charter Middle Schools and Boston Charter High Schools, a uh, kind of uh, 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 emerging picture. Let me very quickly, with my two remaining minutes, show you a couple other interesting facts. These are gains for special needs populations. SPED and English language learners, special education and English language learners, math and English. These are other populations. Gains for special needs populations tend to be commensurate with the gains we see for non-special needs populations. So the charter kids uh, who are in those groups are benefiting about as much as, uh, as uh, non-special needs groups. This are some other outcomes uh, that come a little bit later. This plot, I won't go through in great detail, but what it shows is the distribution of treatment effects uh, across the state. The circles are the urban no excuses charters. Over here in the positive quadrant, that's where things are positive in both math and English. And what we see is that consistent picture of urban schools that tend to be uh, in this no excuses paradigm are doing very well. Down here we have some of the non-urban charters and some of the non-no excuses schools. So there's a nuance there that the type of charter uh, matters quite a bit. One other thing I want to show you very quickly, Boston is piloting an in-district model. These are data from UP Academy. The in-district model is a pioneering model. Boston has been on the frontier of this. Most charters in Massachusetts are startups. They're new schools in some kind of leased space or non-school space. The uh, in-district model takes an existing school and replaces it with a charter, but the charter operator is required to um, accept all the students, to grandfather them, we say, to grandfather the existing kids. Up Academy, uh, Boston was the uh, first school to do this, and this shows relative achievement performance in Up 
This is the takeover year. This is when UP becomes a charter school. It was formerly the Boston uh, Gavin Middle School. And again, math achievement pulls away, ELA pulls away, not quite as dramatically, but still statistically significant. The last fact I'll show you in my remaining minute are some results uh, uh, from non-MCAS, so beyond MCAS. We've looked at post-secondary outcomes. We've looked at whether you go to college, whether you go to a four-year college. Again, these are treatment effects, they're gains. So we see an increase in college going, four-year college going, uh, of about 13 points uh, for going on time and about 16 points or 18 points, I guess that is, uh, for going uh, within two years after high school. So those achievement effects that I'm showing you very quickly echo into longer term outcomes that we think are really defining for the ultimate um, uh, economic status of the students who go to these schools for their earnings and their socioeconomic status. Thank you very much. So good, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Kane from the Harvard Ed School. Looking around the room, my guess is that most of you, many of you, <clears throat> I don't want to say most, many of you are not used to thinking in terms of standard deviation units. Um, so over the last two decades, though, many of us have gotten used to thinking in terms of property values. And so I'm just going to report some of the effects that Josh was describing in terms of uh, units that most people can understand. So on the bottom line here, we're just plotting the, the, the mean scores of Boston Public School students in fourth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. On the top line are the mean scores of students in the Brookline Public Schools in those same grades. Um, the red lines represent what happened to the lottery um, lose uh, winners. The orange line is what happened to the lottery losers. You can see in fourth grade when they were applying to uh, middle school, the lottery winners and losers started out at the same, same place. That's what you'd expect if there really was a randomized lottery. Then when we look at uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, you see that the red line approaches the Brookline public school mean whereas the orange line um, stays where it is slightly above the Boston public school mean. So, and the important thing to remember is in the red line, we're counting everybody who was offered a slot at a charter school. So regardless of whether or not they stayed, regardless in fact of whether or not they attended, we're counting against the charter school ledger, anybody randomly offered a slot and the orange line is for anybody who applied to the same schools that, that lost. So if you said, okay, well, what's the implied effect of a year in a charter school? That would be um, the green line there, which shows actually for over those grades, you would have even more than closed the gap between the Boston public schools and the Brookline public schools. Now, um, because the referendum would eliminate the cap and allow the state to open 12 schools, 12 new charter schools a year, I think there's a lot of anxiety in school districts around the state about, wait a minute, would this eventually lead to charter schools everywhere? And I think that just reflects a misunderstanding of how the cap works because the cap is applied district by district. So imagine everybody in this room, suppose we all had the same credit card limit. Some of us would spend up near the credit card limit uh, each month. Others of us, like my, like my father-in-law, would never get anywhere close to the credit card limit. So when there's an increase in the, in the, in the um, in the cap on charter school enrollment, it only affects the districts that are at or near the cap. For those of us who are far below um, uh, the limit if, if on your credit cards, changing the cap has no effect on you. 
And so I think part of what the misunderstanding is around this charter school debate is just a misunderstanding of the fact that the, the referendum really only affects the districts that are at or near the current cap. There are 15 of those, of those communities listed in this table. That, are, that have 7% or more of, their, of the net school spending going to charter schools. It's Boston, Holyoke, Chelsea, Springfield, Malden. One thing that all of these communities have in common is that they have a larger than average percentage of, of students that are economically disadvantaged. Now, Josh was reporting that the charter, um, the, the lottery effects, some, we, we don't have a large enough sample in every district to be able to estimate the, the effects of, of charter schools using lotteries. So instead, another way to try to do it is to look at student growth percentile. So many people here will be accustomed to looking at student growth percentile. A number of, um, of 50 means that among kids with similar prior achievement histories, a, a kid has scored at the 50th percentile on the most recent assessment. So a number above 50 means that the average kid in a school is moving ahead of uh, similar peers. A number below 50 means that a kid is losing ground relative even to students that had started the year with similar prior achievement. Now, in many of these 15 communities, this table is just reporting the SGP in math and English in each of these communities. You can see, for instance, in Chelsea, the, in the traditional public schools, the, uh, the SGP in math is at 37 and 40, which means not only that the kids in Chelsea are starting the year behind, but they're losing ground relative to similar students around the state. If you look at the, uh, at the charters serving the students from Chelsea, uh, Lynn, and Boston, you see that the SGPs are significantly greater than 50. So for instance, in Chelsea, 73 and 81 are the SGPs in, in, for the charters serving those communities. So that means that kids who are starting the year um, behind are actually gaining ground relative to students around the state who started with similar levels. And the differences, it's the differences in the SGP between the uh, districts and the receiving charters that are most striking. Now, the important thing to point out is that's not true in all of the capped communities. For instance, in Somerville, um, actually in, in 2014, the district had a larger SGP than the than the charters serving that community. And so hopefully the state could use data like this in deciding which, uh, where to allow the charters, uh, charters to open. Um, the next point I want to talk about is, is, the, area, is the financial implications of charters on, on uh, traditional public schools. Uh, so suppose that we start out um, with students attending district schools and then a subset of students decide to move to charters. Under the state's charter law, dollars would follow the students. Um, but the important thing to remember is that also under the state law, in the first year that the student has transferred, the state provides funds to the sending district. Why? Well, because Schools have made commitments to teachers and to facilities that, that are hard to change in the short term. So the state pays actually essentially twice for the student in the first year after the student moves. And then in each of the subsequent five years, the state under law is supposed to provide 25% of, of the funding. Now, it's only after those six years pass that the district is faced with the challenge of, of how to staff its schools appropriately to deal with the smaller enrollments. And it's that process that is, is, is costly in, in, in difficult decisions. But once that transition is made, there's no reason to believe that the district schools would be any less viable than they would have been um, before. And that's actually, it, it's this issue of 
are the reimbursements sufficient to help the districts transition that I think much of this debate uh, boils down to. So I think the evidence that, that we've been accumulating over the last few years really clarifies the choice involved in this referendum. Um, so the first question is, do charters raise achievement? Um, if the answer were no, uh, this would be an easy debate because you'd say, what is the point of reshuffling public resources around schools if it has no effect on student achievement? Well, so if the answer to that were no, it would be easy to vote no on, on the charter referendum. But as, as Josh was just describing, the evidence is extremely strong that that's not the case. So then the second question becomes, okay, do districts need more resources for the transition when, when enrollment is, is shifted? So in the short term, there clearly are going to be challenges. In the longer term, successful school districts come in all shapes and sizes. So if, the, if, if, you, if you're somebody out there who thinks actually no, we think that paying the, that six years of transition costs um, right now that the state uh, uh, provides, that's enough, um, you'd, uh, you'd vote yes on two. Now, how about if you say districts do need me more resources to make time, the transition? Time, time. So, wrap up. You look, yeah. so <laughs> here's the punch. Here's the important punchline I needed to get to. So, if you think that districts do need more resources to make the transition, even then, it's not obvious what the answer ought to be because you have to also ask then who should pay. If, and you have two choices, if you say yes on two, you'd be saying, okay, all of us should pay, but we should be paying in the form of additional reimbursements. If you say no on two, what you're saying is, actually, there's a very select group of Massachusetts residents that are going to pay the cost of allowing these districts to make the transition to the smaller sizes. And that group of people are the low-income children living in the capped, capped communities. So this is not just an issue about, about should we be helping the districts to um, adjust to the lower enrollment. This is about who should pay for it. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the outsider, and I've been asked to come in and talk a little bit about some of the additional evidence that Credo at Stanford University has developed uh, that can contribute to this uh, incredibly important debate in your state. So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, you've heard two different ways of looking at charter school performance in Massachusetts. Uh, and I wanted to share just a moment of uh, explaining how our methodology adds a third way of looking at school performance and what happens to kids. Uh, we use something called the virtual control record. You may also have heard it described as the virtual twin. And the way to think about this is for every single student in a charter school, we've been able to go and find, we go and, and try to find students that go to the schools they otherwise would have attended had they not gone to a charter school. And we create an amalgam of that charter school student's exact matches in the public schools they would have attended. And so there might be five kids in a public school setting who look like this charter school student. We average out what happens to those five students. And so now you have basically Every single characteristic is the same, including their prior academic record, except that one student's in a charter school and one student's in a traditional public school. So that methodology has one advantage that we think is important, which is that means we can try to find matches on all the charter school students, regardless of whether their school was um, admitting students by lottery or not. And so because of that, we have a broader footprint of charter school students, we typically get matches in the in the 80 to 85 percent range. Massachusetts, it's even higher than that. 
So we feel like we get a good picture of charter school activity. Um, and uh, this lets us talk about what happens over the course of a year academically for a charter school student compared to what they would have had had they gone to their traditional public school. We're looking at growth. We measure it in a one-year increment. And we've done this across the country repeatedly. And as you can see on this list, Massachusetts has been in our crosshairs a great deal. Um, we are particularly interested in Massachusetts for a couple of different reasons. As you well know, your overall state performance is well above most other states. And so we have sort of a cheering section back at Credo at Stanford for Massachusetts. Um, also, um, the charter school story here has been one that has been extremely interesting over time. So we continue to be interested in following your story as we have in these four studies. So what I want to do then is to just briefly share with you what the results have been in all of the different ways that we have looked at your charter school picture using our VCR methodology. So this is reading performance. And what you see across the bottom, ooh, let's see if I can get this going. Yay. Uh, are the four different studies that I just mentioned. In the national study in 2009, we found that Massachusetts actually didn't do any different for charter school students than the typical public school student in Massachusetts. But compared to the national average at that time in reading in charter schools, it was a better picture overall, even though it was not significant. Um, in 2012, we were asked to do just a study of Massachusetts itself. And so what you'll see in that sort of gray bar is we took all of the schools that we could identify in the 2009 study and followed them over a period of time. And what you can see there is that their <coughs> academic growth over the course of a year for their students went dramatically higher than it had been just a few years earlier. And in fact, those schools helped to explain the more positive rise from 2009 for all charter schools in Massachusetts. So the 2009 dark blue shows gains when you look at the dark blue line in 2012. When you go to 2013, that bar gets even higher for all charter schools in the state. Um, in 2013, we found that the national average was a little bit positive, but Massachusetts, across all charter schools, was substantially more positive for reading growth. Um, then the most recent study we did was last year, we looked at 41 urban communities around the country. And what you see in the slightly blue bar is a positive urban impact on reading gains for all of the 41 urban regions. But then let me put the, uh, the big one on the table, which is the uh, academic gains that we have seen consistently over time in Boston. And uh, in the 2012 year, when we first put that, that report out, uh, we had Dr. Angrist's results we were able to validate those with a completely different methodology. And we were really delighted to see that those strong results, even with uh, additional years of activity, um, were still pretty stable when you got to um, the 2015 study. So reading performance overall, Massachusetts has had a very strong, very consistent story of positive gains in charter schools relative to what their students would have had had they attended traditional public schools. Um, again, this is math performance, um, and the pattern is consistent throughout Massachusetts over the time periods that we've studied. The dark blue bars are on an upward trajectory. Uh, they continue to be positive. The growth in quality from one time period to the other that we see in 2009 to 2012 shows that individual schools are getting better even though we've completely controlled for all of the student characteristics. So it's not that the students that are attending those schools are somehow more advantaged, they're not. It's that the schools themselves are getting better at learning how to create learning gains for their kids. Uh, and so that positive gain across the period is, is uh, something we do not see in many other states. Uh, and finally, the story uh, about Boston is consistent. What's surprising to us is that math is stronger than reading in Massachusetts. And that's a pattern we do not see other, otherwise. My last point 
Uh, we have not provided you any of the drill down uh, into individual student subgroups on these slides. Um, that's available on our website, credo.stanford.edu. And you're welcome to go there and get more detail. But I can tell you that consistently across all these periods, the students who have been best advantaged by going to charter schools are students who are a minority and in poverty. And the combination of those create larger learning gains in Massachusetts and in Boston than we have seen anywhere else in the country. So this is, uh, I think, an exemplar for the nation, an exemplar for the state, and my hope would be that those opportunities, would, those schools and those techniques would become transferred, would be disseminated across the entire state, certainly, but more particularly should the cap be lifted, that the focus would be on finding ways to replicate those models. Thank you very much. set my timer here so they don't get the hook out. <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting us to this very interesting presentation. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't, we can't really have a balanced discussion of these research findings because neither Paul nor I are uh, academics. Um, I, it should be noted that there are academics, scholars, who uh, feel that these results, uh, because of the methodologies, are not actually valid. Um, for example, that the uh, credo studies uh, leave out uh, some of the best district schools, whereas, on the other hand, the lottery studies uh, leave out some of the weakest um, charter schools. So I'm not saying whether, I'm not saying whether that's valid or not, but I, I would suggest, and I discussed already with one of the organizers, that it would be useful to have a, a conference at which you would invite people from both sides, you know, give them equal time, uh, and really hash out uh, the methodologies and what, what we can know and what still needs to be found out. Um, but, you know, Paul and I were invited to talk about uh, what is missing. And you know, I think we can do that. I think what's missing is real life consequences. So for example, there's a, a study that just came out uh, in July by Roland Fryer of Harvard, uh, a strongly pro-charter uh, researcher, member of the State Board of Education appointed by Governor Baker. Uh, and he was looking at no excuses charter schools in Texas. So it's Texas, but it's the same type of schools as the ones that are expanding in Massachusetts, and in fact, the original KIPP school, of course, is, is uh, a Texas school. And what he found was that uh, test scores were up in those no excuses schools, just as they are up in all of these studies. Uh, that was completely consistent. But he was able to look at earnings later on in life from these graduates in their late 20s. And to his chagrin, he discovered that their earnings were not up. And in his conclusion, he wonders out loud, is there something in the method that these schools are using to raise scores that is actually damaging the kids in the job market? So that's one aspect that still has to do with the charter school kids. But I think that the main thing I want to talk about is the effect of expanding charters on kids who are not in the charter schools. That is the main issue in this referendum campaign. And here's how it played out in Somerville. A few years ago, we had a proposal for a new charter school in Somerville. And uh, parents figured out pretty quickly that the money that would have been taken out of the district would have required the closing of at least one Somerville District School. And because it was the smallest and in the oldest building, the school that would have uh, been closed first turned out to be the most popular school in the district. So people went to the state board uh, or the state department and they said, you know, don't close our school. We love this school. This school is our choice, so don't take away our choice. 
right? And the people at the state said, you know, don't talk to us about harm to your schools. We can't do anything about that. We can only look at the proposal itself, okay? Now, this passed, uh, oh, and by the way, they did not say, well, if your SGP is high, you'll be okay. That's not part of the process. This past February, there was a proposal in Brockton, and Brockton happens to have a nationally known charter, uh, high school. This was a high school proposal. People went to the board and said, don't hurt our school. And again, the board said, You've got to, this is not a criticism of your school, but we can't pay attention to the harm to your schools. You know, in Boston, they have some problems, but they also have some very popular schools. There are probably more kids on waiting lists for popular district schools than charter schools in Boston. Snowden International High School has a, a thousand kids on their waiting list. If question two passes, there will be more, I mean, even this year, Snowden suffered from the cuts. There will be more and more cuts, and the parents who have chosen those schools will lose their choice so that the choice that's offered by charter school boards of trustees can be offered. The boards of trustees have priorities. Also, they had to cut preschool in Boston this year, right? There were people on the waiting list for that. That doesn't count. The only thing that counts is the charter school application. So I think that's a bad way to make decisions. I think we need to be looking at the interests of all children. Thank you. policy position of school committees because there are over 130 uh, school committees already who have passed resolutions in opposition of question two. And there's got to be a reason for that. It's not because we love the unions. We're usually involved in the collective bargaining on the other side of the table. But let's take a look at the numbers. Why does the charter school cap? The charter school cap is a plug in the drain. Uh, for most districts, it's set at 9% of net school spending. For the bottom 10% districts, as calculated by the state, it's 18%. So that if it's the loss of funding that's the issue, you could double the number of charter seats tomorrow by reducing by 50% the liability to the local school district. Uh, things that get school committee members and public folks upset uh, this year, the state calculated the foundation budget, was, which is the basis for all school funding. They deflated it by 22 hundredths of a percent. In the same year, the amount of money being taken out of Chapter 78 to, uh, to go to charter schools went up 9.33 percent. Charter school funding is an entitlement by formula. Public schools are funded by the whims of the appropriations of the legislature, city councils, and town meetings. Uh, over the years, there's been a lot greater increase in the amount of money that's being garnished uh, for charter schools relative to the changes in Chapter 70. And there have been years where Chapter 70 has dropped. Uh, fiscal 04 went down 20%, but yet there was over a 10% increase in the amount of money garnished out for charter schools. This is what the current picture is, without uh, question two. Notice that little green blip at the top, that's the reimbursement. Most of that money is coming directly out of chapter 70. Now, this is what question two states. This is the language, and basically what it says is that it's going to remove the cap for the first 12 applications for charter schools. Uh, it, 12 schools, 1% of the current population, that's uh, 9,534 students. Uh, so that's about $120 million given the current charter school tuition rate. Add that to the current dra uh, graph and you can see why school committees are getting very anxious about what happens if this passes. It's not a good situation now, it gets worse if, if question two is adopted. Now, this is how schools are funded, and I'm using Lowell because I work for the city of Lowell. 
And Lowell's foundation budget is 183 million and change. It's governed by the number of students who attend schools. And school funding is forward funding. The count of students on October 1st, 2015 governs the fiscal 17 budget. So this is based on students in attendance last October, a year ago. So that you're not, so that you're not paying double when you've got that first year uh, reimbursement because a kid's funding doesn't come until a year after they show up on your door under this system. Now what happens, everybody's playing by the same set of ground rules, but what happens in Massachusetts is the foundation budget is severely underfunded, particularly on the special ed side. So that there's three times the foundation budget is what's actually being spent on out of district special ed costs. And so what happens is that a public school district needs to move money out of the other categories, move it over there. In Arlington, it's five times. Take the in district costs, there's also a gap. Again, we're moving money over to the right-hand side to pay for the special ed students. Charters don't have that drain. So that what the, the net uh, problem is, is that where charter schools are getting $11,000 in change in tuition, the Lowell schools have only about $8,500 to spend on the same student. So the difference when you bring it out to 1,600 students of $4.7 million. That's 63 teachers. That's double the entire budget in Lowell for materials and supplies. And we could, we could do universal pre-K in Lowell if we had that money and have $2 million left over. Now, the way public governance works in Massachusetts, and this is a town, we're appropriating every cent of our money. If you come to our town meeting, this is the way we do business, You've got appropriations for numbers as small as $2,000 in town meeting, but the charter school money doesn't come through any kind of appropriation. And the balance is this. Whose money is it? Well, the average single family home is contributing about $7,000 into the town treasury. Time's out, Paul. Could you okay. wrap up? Uh, we lose about $12,000 if a kid goes off to a charter school. I mean, I'm, I'm a little disadvantaged in the 5 to 10 thing here, but the numbers do not work as they exist. Passing question two makes it worse. Thank you. Hopefully in, uh, in the questions that we're going to ask now, we will... Uh, allow uh, the uh, differences to emerge in uh, a fuller way. Uh, okay. Time it myself just to make sure. <laughs> so uh, let, let's start with, uh, with democratizing the presentation a little bit. So one of the uh, uh, interesting, uh, how many of you are psychometricians? Raise your hand. Okay, one. Okay. So let, let's, let's clarify a little bit the meaning of what that standard deviation means and uh, the differences across uh, schools. So, uh, you know, this is a question for Mackey. I was struck by the, uh, the Boston effect, and uh, I was also struck by the, the relative national flatness in terms of differences across schools, but Massachusetts still being 0.1 of a standard deviation uh, higher than, uh, than uh, other schools. So the, the, question, the question for me is, what's the meaning of 0.1 in the real world? Well, 0.1 is a tenth. That's the first part. Uh, <laughs> actually. A tenth uh, of what, though? Okay. So we understand that most people don't think in standard deviation units, uh, and so using uh, the results from the National Assessment of Education Progress, NAEP, we actually have been able to do a transformation of standard deviation units, which nobody understands, 
to something that we call days of learning, which most people do understand. And so if you think about 180 days as being about one school year, that's sort of the classic school length of a school year, uh, we can translate standard deviation units into either additional days of going to school, assuming that you get learning every single day, or that you didn't go to school 180 days, right? If the number is negative, then it's as though you did not attend school for a few days. So the transformation here of 0.1 standard deviations is 70 days of learning, 70. And so when you look at Massachusetts as a 0.1 effect, that means charter school students gain enough learning as though they had gone to school for an additional 70 days. Now put that up against the Boston effect sizes and it begins to blow the mind because a 0.3 standard deviation there is 210 days of learning. So that, that's pretty strong effects and the fact that we saw those consistently over time says that the learning gains that charter schools are able to get for their students are dramatically higher than the learning gains in Boston otherwise, which I would just share with you are above the state average. That's one of the peculiarities of Boston is that the learning gains in Boston public schools are also above the state average. So the extraordinary gains that we see in the charter sector are over and above a trend line of learning that's more positive in Boston than the rest of the state. Thank you. So from the, from the policy perspective and also the administration perspective, the, the question uh, that I had listening to that information was, uh, what's, what's the why, what's the consequential uh, effect of this? And I noted with the information earlier that, that there is a difference between what's happening in the quote unquote suburbs and what's happening in Boston. And uh, there's also a difference between what's happening in Massachusetts and what's happening in other places of New Jersey. So uh, uh, what, why do you think there is such a different effect in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts and to a much greater extent in Boston than uh, in other places? And how should that be shaping the uh, actual decisions that are being made in this area? Should I comment on that, Andres? Uh, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, let me also add one. Uh, I'd like to answer Andre's question because it's a thing that our group has studied extensively. In fact, we have a study called Explaining Charter School Effectiveness. Uh, I wanted to add one piece of context to Mackey's scaling. Um, many of you will have heard uh, of Boston Latin School, of course, which is the jewel in the crown of the public schools in Boston. It's a highly selective school. It does not admit by lottery. It chooses the highest achievers in the district on the basis of an admissions test. The Kip Lynn School in our study, which admits by lottery and serves a uh, similarly low income um, uh, minority population, is producing achievement, achievement uh, levels on par uh, with Boston Latin School in middle school grades. And that's without all that selection that goes into the Boston Latin School. So that's a very important piece of context. It's something that um, anybody who observes the public school scene should find really quite remarkable. <clears throat> um, as to uh, why Boston does so well, uh, Boston uh, has a lot of uh, what, what uh, I think of and my colleagues think of as well-established charter providers who have a track record of success. And the state has been very good at um, you know, extending um, their, the mandate of these campuses to expand on the basis of evidence. And I think that would likely be true uh, going forward. The proven providers, the schools that do well in large urban districts like Boston, uh, tend to follow the sort of no excuses recipe. The no excuses recipe includes a long day, a long year, a focus on traditional reading and math instruction, an emphasis on discipline and comportment, a um, use of a lot of data in uh, the uh, way that they monitor uh, their teachers. In particular, they videotape teachers. And they kind of break teaching down the way the NFL breaks football down. They look at the video and they say, who's doing a good job? And um, they observe their teachers very closely and, and give them feedback on 
how to do a good job. They tend to hire very young, uh, highly motivated teachers, uh, a lot of TFA as well, Teach for America interns, and um, they look very hard at, the, at who comes in and, and, and who is uh, going to fit in with their model. So in, in Boston, we see the fruits of that kind of approach to education. Um, I should say um, Boston is distinguished by that, but it's not the only district that has a lot of no excuses, and it's not the only district that has that kind of performance. So for example, we've looked at New Orleans schools. New Orleans, uh, post-Katrina New Orleans is America's first all-charter district. And the way that happened is very much the way uh, the Gavin School was converted to a charter. Uh, uh, low performing in-district schools were uh, uh, given to uh, charter operators to manage. And that produced similarly spectacular achievement gains. Uh, in, uh, in those schools. Again, mostly no, excuse, no excuses schools. Uh, we also saw uh, in a recent study we've seen similar results for Denver. So it's certainly the case, and Mackey's data bear this out, our, our own data bear this out, you know, that there are different kinds of charters and they're not all created equally, and you want to be careful, you know, as you think about expanding the charter sector, that the people in charge of that are paying close attention to who's going to get the charters and what standards they're going to be held to. Massachusetts' track record on that is so far quite, quite impressive. So, the, so I hear uh, two separate uh, streams to the answer. One is that something has to do with actual practices in those schools. Mm -hmm. That include, for example, expanded time, which help explain the real world difference around time. The other one is that something has to do with the quality of the charter being authorized. And Massachusetts has been remarkable in the context of other states in being quite tight around authorization. And, and this is all about loosening, uh, you know, some might say slightly. Paul just suggested that it's not so slight uh, around uh, the number of charters who now potentially enter this arena. Uh, uh, so what, what, what suggests that, uh, uh, or what might be the recommendations around uh, practice in order to uh, deal with the question of scale, uh, as opposed to simply projecting that because the outcomes has been, have been uh, positive in the past that they're going to be replicated in the future. So, um, uh, one um, question to look at is what has happened in Boston since the last time the cap was increased in 2010? So uh, where charter enrollment in Boston um, has increased from, I think, around uh, 8 or 9 percent up to about 14, 15 uh, percent now. And yet, as far as I can tell, the, the impacts, even though that's a much larger percentage increase than the statewide increase uh, envisioned by the cap, has, the schools have maintained the, the, you know, the same quality impacts. In fact, two of our associates at SEII, uh, Chris Walters and Sarah Cohotis, looked specifically at the schools that were created in the wake of the 2010 expansion. And the, uh, these were uh, Boston, Boston charters. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you remember, but that was the, the last time we, we had this discussion. And um, there was a similar set of issues and uh, concerns. And the state, uh, again, uh, at that time, allowed a kind of a controlled expansion. Uh, they um, authorized a relatively small number of uh, additional charter schools, I think something on the scale of what's proposed in question two today. And um, it's, it is indeed a, an interesting uh, matter to look at those additional schools. And um, our, our research suggests that they're producing gains uh, commensurate with what the uh, initial wave of schools was doing. Paul? Can, can I? Can I just say that, I just want to make clear, 9,500 seats, right? And those 9,500 seats are not going to be spread around the state, right? A very big proportion of those seats are going to be in Boston. So to say that what happened in 2010, you know, is similar to what we're talking about now, I don't think so. This is going to be a vastly faster increase in the uh, percentage of Boston kids in charter schools. And what was the result of the 2010, you know, expansion or the expansion that followed 2010? 
part of that you saw last spring for those people who read the Boston Globe, massive cuts, a student walkout, the mayor then rescinding some of those cuts and deciding instead to cut preschool. And the kids in the high school saying, oh, you know, we got what we asked for, but what about our younger siblings? We're not happy about that. At that same time, or actually two, two weeks earlier, the state board had approved um, 11, I think it's 1,100 more charter seats $17 million more that will be cut from the Boston schools. And the Boston <coughs> School Committee chair went to that uh, state board meeting and said, don't do this to us. He said, you may arguably, I'm trying to remember the words, doesn't matter, you may be helping some kids, but you're hurting more kids. And again, the state, it was the same meeting as the Brockton meeting. And he apparently had not realized because he said he was flabbergasted that the state board would not take into account harm to other children, including preschool children, from this decision. And you know, it's not like the state board said, oh, we'd rather have the 1,100 seats. No, they said, we've got proposals, the proposal meet, meet the legal requirements, therefore we must do it. Paul? See, the, the issue here, and if we're talking in the context of question two, there are 351 municipalities in the, in the Commonwealth. And if we focus our conversation to Boston, we're missing the impact of this, like, this, this ballot question on the other 350 municipalities. Now, uh, Arlington borders Medford, Somerville, and Cambridge. Uh, Somerville's at the cap, Cambridge and, and Medford are close. So if you plunk a charter school three blocks into Somerville, it's going to have an impact on Arlington. So the question is, does question two impact suburban communities? Yes, because it lifts all the caps, and, it, and it's not municipality specific. Kids going to charter schools can and often do cross municipal lines. Natick does not have a charter school. The nearest one is in Framingham. Uh, they lose 39 kids to charter schools, and the net payoff for them, they get no reimbursement, by the way, is $435,000. Now, these 39 kids are spread over 13 grades in eight buildings, so the costs to be reduced within the district are very minimal, but, and the amount leaving the district is disproportionate to the reduced operating costs of the district based on the loss of 39 students. Now, Natick is also about $2,000 below their Proposition 2.5 spending cap. So they can't raise money locally unless they either go for Proposition 2.5 override, increase user fees, move money from the municipal side of the budget into the school budget to compensate for the loss, or to make cuts on the school side. So in terms of the economics, the way things are set up right now, the charter kids get uh, an advantage in terms of money being taken off the top of the Chapter 70 account, and the municipalities have no ability to go and deal with the impact through local taxation, and state aid has not kept up with the pace of educating kids since, since the year 2000. So to look at it in the context of the current funding structure, you would not have the opposition from school committee members if we felt this was a level playing field, if the amount of money that followed the kid out the door was equivalent to what our costs were if we educated the child in the district, we wouldn't have a problem. In fact, Arlington's got an increasing enrollment. We don't know what to do. We're building in buildings, sticking portables on the ends of buildings. A charter school, if it was level funded, if, if it didn't have a negative impact, might be a welcome solution for us but we can't afford to do it. We'd have to lose too much out of our local funding and hurt the kids within our district to go and send kids off to a charter. Paul, uh, Tom? So, I, there is no question that when students move to charter schools, that the district schools that, are, that, that those students used to attend will eventually have to make some hard decisions about downsizing. But 
I just want to clarify, so while there might be effects on the district administration and the, dis the, um, the district schools, the impacts on the students left behind, actually, th there's not evidence that there's much harm there. And, and let me describe why. So here in, in Boston, since 2011, spending in the Boston public schools has gone up 24%, even though Boston public schools has 4% fewer students over that time period, primarily because of the Boston the charter departures. So expenditures per student in Boston have gone up s substantially. I ironically, that actually has a, a, a double penalty uh, uh, because as the spending per student goes up in Boston, the payments to the charters per student also have to go up. But if you look at, okay, well, those are the financial impacts. What about, what are the consequences in terms of the, the quality of, of the peers. So many folks worry that not, not just about the financial effects, but are the charter schools draining the more um, engaged, more focused students? And on that, um, you know, one of the things that's happened over the last few years is as charter enrollment has increased, the difference between the charter applicants and the non-applicants has also shrunk. So remember in that graph I showed you, the, the, the students and the who were charter applicants started out somewhere above the Boston public school mean. Over the last few years, that difference has shrunken. So like in, in math, there's about a 0.045 uh, standard deviation difference in the baseline achievement for charter applicants versus those choosing not to, to apply. In English, the difference is around 0.1 standard deviation. Now you say, okay, so what's the effect if you, if you lose those kids who were 0.045 or 0.1 standard deviation above the, the, the mean at, at baseline? Well, most of the folks who try to estimate the effects of peers on, this, on students' own achievement find that you get about a tenth of, um, of the, the difference in the, in the quality of the peers reflected in your own achievement. So if I, have, if I get <coughs> peers with scores 10 points higher, that tends to improve my own achievement by about one point. So multiply that 0.045 difference, which is a, fair, a smaller difference uh, because of the increase in enrollment, the, the difference between applicants and non-applicants has, has shrunken. You have to multiply that 0.045 by 0.1, um, and you have to multiply the, the small difference in ELA uh, scores at baseline also by 0.1. So the evidence of the effects of charter departures on the students left behind um, is it suggests that if there are effects, they're likely to be uh, quite small. And partially that's driven by the fact that the proportion of Boston students applying to charters has gone up, so they're not such a select group anymore. Okay, so I, I committed to... Uh, if, if, I, if I may just say one thing, I don't see how $4.7 million leaving the Lowell Public Schools above the cost of educating a Lowell student is a small effect. That's 63 teachers that could be reducing class size and providing additional service. But the, but the but point is... Excuse, the, excuse me, excuse students. me, Tom, 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 excuse me. We, we need to leave some time for the audience, which we committed to, and hopefully in the context of the questions you can uh, uh, raise your issues. Uh, I'm reserving one question about the real world effects, but in the meantime, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Yeah. Closeness. Closeness is good. Um, my name is Issa Zimmerman. I'm a retired high school principal and superintendent of schools in three school districts in <coughs> Boston. Um, one of the issues that is often hidden is the cost uh, that you've all explained, the cost to the public schools that's disproportionate to the number of kids leaving. But another issue that's bothered me from the beginning, and I was one of the five superintendents who wrote the original MASS um, position paper on charter schools. 
There are two issues, actually. One, charter schools operate under very different restrictions. Could, could you ask a question, though, I rather am, than but I have speech. to set it oh, up. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're very smart, so they will, they will respond to your question. I know they're very smart, but they don't know what I was going to ask. So they, they will after you ask. <laughs> Um, so, one question is, um, what, are the, what are the effects at the charter schools for success that were supposed to have been shared with every other school in the Commonwealth? And I've never seen that. I said that at another meeting. Someone said, Boston does it all the time. But I don't see it anywhere else. Um, and so that, let me ask that question. So um, that, that's an interesting question because part of the motivation for charters is not just about the charter kids. Um, you know, if you're supposed to learn, we would like to learn from the charter experience. There's some evidence that that's playing out. Um, in Boston, the most relevant is the uh, turnarounds. So we looked at three Boston turnarounds in our recent study that includes the study of UP, which is the in-district model in Boston. Uh, which I should say I think is kind of the frontier and, and it's possible that a fair number of the new charters that we would get would be like up their takeovers. The existing building comes under charter control. That produced uh, very strong gains um, at the Gavin School when that happened. Um, Boston has other reform models uh, and we compared those to, so they're non-charter reform models and, and we compared those to up. Uh, uh, most of them did not produce similar gains. There was one that was quite impressive, uh, and uh, that, that has a lot of the charter elements. And so on the one hand, that suggests there are things that you can do in the district uh, that are going to improve achievement. Um, but it's also clear that the success at that school was informed by what was doing well in the charter sector. Yeah, Matthew? I'd just like to amplify what Josh was saying. There are... There are lots of examples where practices from charter schools have been intentionally transferred, um, and Josh's findings are, are borne out elsewhere. It seems that the real innovation that charter schools bring is not any particular pedagogical approach. I mean, you've heard about the no excuses schools. That's not innovative. That's actually sort of retro, right? But, but there are lots and lots of other ways that charter schools do get great results. Here's the thing. I actually have come to the conclusion that it is releasing the school level discretion, giving schools autonomy. And, and let's be clear, autonomy isn't just about organizing a school day or organizing a school year. It's actually having command of their resources and being able to move resources as they need to to meet the needs of students. Where you see districts giving those kinds of autonomies to district schools, I'm talking Denver, talking San Francisco, talking San Diego, I can name other districts. Where you see that happening, those public schools and their results start to turn in the same trajectory that we see charter schools with that kind of autonomy realizing for themselves. Yeah. Alan? Yeah, uh, so here's something that I wish the No Excuses charters would learn from district schools. They don't seem to be set up to deal with families that move. You know, in Boston, there are 4,000 homeless kids in the district schools. That's about one out of every 13 kids. And the charter schools say they can't take people just any time they show up, right? They only take people in certain grades. They only take people at certain times of the year. Otherwise, it's too disruptive. If you come at the wrong time, you can go to the district school. Now, if all schools followed that, the lead, then we would have thousands of kids who would not be able to go to school. And then we would not have public education. I mean, the one, the one other thing is that in terms of turnarounds, Actually. Uh, we, we've, we've just got to get beyond Boston. Lowell had a level four school, turned it to level one within three years. Unfortunately, we didn't have all the resources that, we, that other schools could have. But uh, uh, we're, we're doing it in public education if we have the ability to, to fund it and, and give that autonomy. Okay. Yes. I've taught for 35 years in an urban rim school, as the statisticians like to call it. Um, 
in that time, I think we have come to grips with a lot of the things reported uh, through the studies that you, people started 10 or 15 years ago, uh, particularly uh, informing the debate and some of the others. But what stunned us, I think, with that study was the suggestion that results from a school which had a smaller class size, which restricted access, only those who wanted to go, who brought in kids only at certain times of the year, would be compared against our situation, we would average 150 kids coming into our class during the year, just at the high school. We would have class sizes were much larger. And then you would want to say, as you did again today, that you're comparing apples to apples. When you have a surprising result from your point of view of a school that does better because it only has 15 to 10 students in front of a teacher as opposed to 25 to 30 is dealing with kids who are there most of the time as opposed to a fairly high absentee rate in could, a district yeah, like ours. Could you, could you ask a question, please? I guess that comes down to the study itself. Is there a peer review that's ever been done to suggest that this study does compare apples to apples, not just a study done by others with similar points of view? And in the end, I guess the justification, would, the question I have is, how can you possibly compare the results of a class and say it's because of a particular technique when the differences between the charter classroom situation is so vastly different than a public school situation. So yeah. can, I, can I ask my reserve question in the context of that question, which is that are your categories granular enough in order to be able to measure the differences? And I, I refer that, I connect that to Paul's statement about special education, for example, which is that if your category is students with disabilities, it doesn't necessarily measure the differences between uh, students with disabilities with high incidence and students with disabilities with low incidence, which impacts what happens around funding, for example. So part of what the field experiences is a sense of uh, the research is somehow not understanding the constraints or the way it plays out in the real world. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you address that question? Uh, let me see if I can respond to the, I think there's three distinct points there. Uh, they're all fair points. Let me see if I can respond to them very quickly. Um, sir, you asked whether the studies are peer reviewed. All the studies I'm referring to, there was an initial Boston Foundation report, which of course is not a peer reviewed study, uh, that later became a, a peer reviewed study. So the studies I'm drawing on for my slides, um, with one exception, which just because they did the graphs in color, uh, uh, from the Boston Foundation report, but the rest of it is coming from peer review. So the, the basic picture is from a body of scholarly work and, and not, not advocacy. Um, our team is not, um, we're not consultants, uh, uh, we're not paid to do this work. We ask the questions, we, we write papers, we send them for publication, and they're reviewed and they're published in, in our journals like the American Economic Review. Um, as to whether the schools are similar, of course we are sensitive to that, so we're interested in, for example, comparisons of class size and that sort of thing, uh, length of day, uh, and, and uh, other measures of resource inputs, and our research uh, makes those comparisons. Generally, we don't see large differences in class size. Uh, effective charters do tend to have longer days and longer years. Uh, I think that's part of their success. We don't see uh, big gaps in class size in general. Occasionally, we see some. Um, Andres, your, uh, your, your, your question, remind me. My, my question is about the, oh, about the, special gra ed, the granularity. granularity of, it's it's of not special. simply about special ed. It's also about things like uh, uh, mobility of students right. or uh, ability to control yeah. what happens with enrollment so, after the startup uh, of the uh, Right, so school. our lottery research, is, many people have commented that there's a lot of issues with mobility. Uh, and that is true, That's you, and, and people may observe some of the charter schools and they'll say, well, a third of the kids aren't there anymore. Um, but that's true in general in an urban population, that there's a lot of mobility and um, you know, kids who uh, show up for school uh, in the beginning don't necessarily finish the year and, and so on. Uh, new kids show up and, and, and that sort of thing. That's ubiquitous in urban districts. We therefore compare uh, mobility out of charter schools with mobility in other schools. And we see that the exit rates are similar, the turnover is similar. So the relevant facts here are always relative facts. 
how do transitions in charters compare with transitions in other districts? And we see that there's um, not, not much of a difference there. That's something we look at over and over again. The issue of spe special education, you know, um, for those of you who are familiar with that, there's sort of a, a, a mechanism that identifies kids by level of need. Uh, and we have uh, our, it's actually our graduate student, Elizabeth Cetrin, who's sitting over there, who's the specialist on that. Uh, and the uh, results that uh, I briefly showed you on special needs populations, special education and English language learners uh, come from her thesis. And she goes into great detail on um, the effects of charters on special needs populations, on special education groups, and, uh, and that includes an analysis by level of need and level of inclusion. And, and generally the effects are fairly consistent there, that the charters are doing well um, for the students in, in all of the groups and also that uh, charter representation in those groups is increasing and approaching the, the district mean. I'm, I'm going to challenge you as a former uh, superintendent, which is that when, uh, when, uh, when researchers study mobility, you're researching, you should research in mobility at the level of the school when you look at charters because they tend to be, in many places, single LEAs. But at the district level, it's aggregated. So if kids are leaving non-charter schools, they go in, generally they tend to go into other non-charter uh, schools. If, uh, if they leave uh, a charter school, they tend to go into the non-charter schools. Charter stayed fixed around who comes in. So how you look at mobility matters tremendously. The other aspect of special education is that if the charters are not set up to serve the extremely low incidence kids, then simply categorizing kids as students with disabilities just doesn't do justice to what is happening at the aggregate mm -hmm. level. So that's, that's just a challenge in terms of thinking about the granularity. I do wanna allow for the opportunity for the audience to ask another question. Um, I'll follow up to first thank you all for such a varied picture of the charter debate in the state um, from Boston and, and statewide in particular. Um, my quick, first quick question is a follow up to what the superintendent said, which is you, no one has talked about discipline and the biggest challenge of the new excuses charter schools is that the, mo the highest performing ones suspend up to 70% of their students. And the second quick question is what do you think is going to happen? If the um, referendum passes, do you, I'm curious as to whether the pro-charter folks on the right think that 12 schools will be approved for the next few years in this drumbeat, because that's really the disaster scenario that is making, uh, leading, kind of leading to so much opposition. So I'd like to take a crack at that. Um, I, I will say outright, I am not familiar with the discipline patterns in the schools in Massachusetts. What I can say is that um, the turnover rates in charter schools, as Dr. Angers just mentioned, are equivalent to uh, those in, in traditional schools that those students would otherwise have attended. So what that, excuse me, excuse me, I'm trying, excuse me, excuse me, I'm trying to get to your question. What it suggests is that um, at least expulsion policies are not increasing the number of students who leave. That's not to say that there couldn't be counseling out. There could be counseling out of discipline problems. What I think is a uh, new frontier for charter authorizing is a requirement that has been supported by charter schools and their uh, respective associations which is that authorizing reviews of applications should include a strong review of disciplinary and expulsion policies that have to meet community standards. So I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's going to solve yeah. discipline problems in all schools, but I do think that it's at least a place that people can start. So part of what we're experiencing is the need to have another hour for uh, <laughs> this debate. So I, I do want to have I do want to ask uh, Alan and Paul to respond to the following two uh, elements of the discussion. Number one is that regardless of the picture, it does appear that there is a, a strong positive effect, at least in schools in Massachusetts, and especially in schools in the high need communities in Massachusetts, for students who end up in these schools. 
And secondly, that there is extraordinary demand on the part of many, many parents to uh, send their kids to these schools. So as a function of a democratic imperative and as a function of the need to give school kids as many points of access to good schools as possible, uh, isn't the issue one of how the law is written in implementation and governance uh, of what happens rather than simply the, availability, the, the, the expansion of these schools? Okay, well, um, I just want to remind everybody that what's on the ballot in November is not any change in the law other than lifting the cap. So if people want to talk about it, and there have been many proposals for improving the law, that would be great. Let's do that, <laughs> right? But let's not eliminate all the constraints before we do that. Um, as for your first point, I was going to say something, and I don't remember what it was. Well, <laughs> let, let, let me uh, grab that. You mentioned democratic imperative, in that if we're making a policy decision at a local level, where to put the money, do we do it in extended day? Do we extend the year, or do we send the money to a charter school? What is our choice? That choice is being removed from the town that is essentially funding the outcome. So that if we were to revise the authorizing process to include the requirement of some sort of a town buy-in, the way we govern regional vocational districts in the state, if we set it up that way, the, the school committee opposition goes away tomorrow. Uh, 12 new charter schools, what's the impact? Charlie Baker's the governor. Charlie Baker appoints members of the State Board of Education. He appointed a chairman who donated $100,000 to Yes on Two. He's in favor of yes on two. The longer he's in office, the more change he'll have in the membership of the State Board of Education. And that yes, the, po the overwhelming possibility is that we will hit the 12 charter schools once he has effective control of the State Board of Ed. But take a look at those reimbursements. If the charter tuitions go way up, what is the probability the legislature is going to fund uh, the, the reimbursements at a rate commensurate with the increase in charter tuitions. So uh, I, I think our time is up. Uh, uh, as I said, we could have another hour. Uh, you, you complained about five minutes, but you had the last word. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. We will make the slides available. <laughs>